Well, welcome everybody to our second virtual Ways and Means Committee meeting. Um, we're going to spend the morning talking about uh, education finance, and um, I also have added a lot of this, um, conversation into the morning. Is that getting an echo from everybody? Everybody. Okay, um, so we're going to have a brief conversation about provider tax as well, because the Senate acted on that yesterday. That's part of the bill that's coming over, and I just want to be sure the committee gets briefed on what's in the Senate bill. And if people, um, just to remind people that the House um, is going to be in session at one o'clock, so we'll be finished in plenty of time for people to listen in on that um, if they uh, choose to. I'm going to. Um, so any um, anything anybody wants to check in on before, whoops, I just got bumped out, um, wants to check in on before we get started. We're going to start with Mark, and we've got uh, Mark, Doug Farnham, Karen Horn, and School Boards Association and Superintendents Association all lined up to testify. Raise your hand. Anyone? No? Nope. Okay. Uh, Mark, I think it's uh, it's to you. Okay, um, good morning, everybody. Um, I um, sent Sorsha earlier this morning, I sent her um, an education fund outlook. Um, and I also sent um, an, an issue brief that sort of um, outlines the issues. Um, do you want me to start with the education fund outlook and walk you through that? Yes, why don't you start there and then we'll go to the issue brief because the issue brief is overwhelming. So we'll start with <laughs> something smaller. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> whoops. So, all right, um, I'm not sure if you're looking at it or not, but I will assume everybody can see it. <laughs> if you um, uh, take a look at that sheet and you look at the middle column, um, that should look familiar to everybody. Um, that's, that's what we've been using prior, prior to this um, recess of the legislature. And if you take a look at that, you can, if you go all the way down to the bottom, you can see on line 27, there's a $36.4 million stabilization reserve that's a full 5% reserve. And then if you go down to line 31, you can see the $12.9 million surplus that we were anticipating to have available at the close of 2020. So that, that's where we were, we were prior to this um, COVID-19 forecast. If you then move to the right-hand most column, you can see that the only change um, that we've made there is into the revenues and appropriations is that on line nine, you see a $40 million reduction in education fund sources. That $40 million is the midpoint of the current estimate we have for loss of non-property tax revenues, which is 35 to $45 million. Um, we assume, we've assumed in here that we're gonna collect all of the education property tax um, that we have um, booked on here. So you can see on line 10 that total revenue, uh, total education fund sources dropped by 40 million to um, $1.7 billion roughly, 1.671 million. And if you go down to line 21, you can see that our total uses has, is unchanged. So all the action on the balance sheet is taking place on the bottom sections. If you look on line 22, you can see we went from a $15.5 million operating deficit to a $55.5 million operating deficit. The amount that we had to transfer from the stabilization reserve to balance the fund was to, to um, make the 5%, um, the full 5% uh, reserve goes from 0.7 up to 27.8 taken out of there. And so if you go to line 27, you can see that the current year stabilization reserve has dropped from 36.4, which is a full 5% reserve, to $9.3 million, which is a 1.3% reserve. And keep in mind um, that that's the midpoint of the estimate. So it could be based, you know, assuming this, this estimate um, range is valid, could be up to $5 million more than that in there or $5 million less. Um, if you then jump down all the way to line 31, you can see that the surplus that we were anticipating um, in FY20 um, is now assumed to be um, used to support um, education fund in 2020. So, um, and you know, if you want to, if you want to just figure out how this works, you can think that 12.9 
plus the $27.1 million additional transfer out of the stabilization reserve equals $40 million, which is the amount we needed to cover up on line nine. So um, let me see if there's questions. Yeah. Um, anyone? I don't see any. Um, take a minute here. Uh, I've got Robin. Robin. Yeah. Go ahead, Robin. Sorry, just quickly, I, I just realized we're talking about this current fiscal year. Yes, that's right. So you know, we, we, ha we, we have information, we have some estimates for what the impact is going to be in 2020, that 35 to $45 million loss right. of um, basically sales tax monies because of okay. you know, decreased demand and that kind of thing. We did not do an FY21 outlook at this point because the revenue loss in FY21 at this point is completely speculative. Right. Um, Tom Kovetz indicated that he thinks it's going to be much more severe than, the, than what we're seeing right now for 2020. And that may, right now we're only showing a revenue downgrade for non-property tax revenues. And we're assuming that we'll be able to collect all of the education tax revenues that we've built for in 2020. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably a fairly safe assumption because most of that money has already been collected. Right. But when we get to 2020, 20, 2021, then I have a lot, much less confidence that we're going to be able to collect mm -hmm. all the education property tax money that we built for because loss of income due to layoffs, um, business losses and everything like that may make it hard for people to um, make those make those tax payments in a timely manner. Right. So we're talking about a pretty dramatic drop for the rest of this fiscal year, which ends June 30th and not leaving us very much to start of next fiscal year. That's we have, correct. We'll have a reserve of we'll have a reserve of 9.3 million if this is how we go. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Am I reading that right? That, that's that's correct. We'd start next year with 9.3 million dollars, which is only a 1.3 percent reserve. Right. No surplus, no other money, and um, and again, there's there's you know we don't we don't know what the revenue situation is going to be. Right. Of course. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure I understood it right. Um. Let me see if there's other question, uh, Mark. I'm going to quickly ask you one. The 40 million uh, estimate of mm -hmm. the loss of revenue. Does that assume that the sales tax um, money that's being uh, collections that are being delayed all come in? It it, it does, and so um, that, that's another wrinkle. Um, the the administration has proposed delaying delaying the collection of the meals and rooms tax as well. Until, until June 25th. So on this sheet, I'm assuming that even if it's delayed, we'll eventually collect all that money, but that's a risk. Um, we're, you're gonna be asking businesses to make four monthly payments on June 25th. If they haven't been able to make the first three monthly payments, there's a risk there that they won't have the money available. And um, they, they could use, even though they're trustee taxes, um, I believe that there's no requirement that they be segregated or anything. So it's possible that some of those monies could be used to, um, you know, for payroll, keeping businesses afloat, that kind of thing. So there's a risk there. I think Grant Graham can talk um, talk about that issue too. Right, and it's not just rooms and meals; it's the sales tax as well, which is larger, right? Um, I, I wasn't aware of that. I thought it was only the meals and rooms tax. Oh, okay. Well, things are changing. Things are changing fast. So I thought it was both. So we'll find out. Um, okay. okay. All right. Um, other questions? Anyone has for Mark on the balance sheet? I don't see any. Um, so go ahead and uh, go to the other document. Okay. Um, I, I, I realize this is a dense document and there's a lot in here, but um, maybe if I walk you through the, the points on the summary and I can answer any questions as I go through that, would that, would that work? Uh, that's, that sounds fine. And uh, I want to ask people, um, <coughs> excuse me, does everybody have it up on a separate screen or do you need it on the screen as well? Ah, I don't know how to ask that question of everyone. <laughs> we'll leave it up and um, go ahead. Okay, so um, starting at the top um, under summary on page one, um, non-property tax revenues for FY 2020 are now expected to fall from 35 to 45 million below the forecast. That's the number we just looked at on the balance sheet. Um, in terms of education property taxes, municipalities have already collected uh, most of the tax due for 2020. 
Um, there's about $125 million still outstanding, we think. That's not, that number is not, it's a big number, but it's not that concerning, I don't think. I mean, even if 1% um, of that money was not collected, um, it would be like a one and a quarter million dollar um, hit on the education fund, so it's not huge. I think the bigger concern is that there are a large number of municipalities that um, haven't collected it at all. And I think you will see when we get to the next page that there are 62 towns that only have two payments. So they have fully one half of their education tax liability still outstanding. Um, those, those 62 communities may have, uh, it may be an issue for those communities. Um, school districts will need to either reallocate existing funds, use reserves or run deficits to cover the cost of any um, COVID-19 related spending um, in the current school year. Um, that's because you know, budgets are fixed and um, unless, unless schools receive some money from some other additional sources, they're gonna have to live with what they have. However, I, I don't think that the services that school districts are currently providing, um, the COVID-19 related services are gonna have a huge impact and there may be federal money available for um, school meals and um, the administration's indicated there will be some money available for childcare services that are provided to essential employees and that kind of thing. So um, I don't think that's a huge problem. Um, fourth bullet is the education fund, as we saw, is going to run a significant operating deficit um, in 2020. Uh, the projected 12.9 surplus we were carrying is gone and most of the stabilization reserve is going to be depleted. So we're going to be starting FY21 um, in kind of a weak position. Um, one bit of good news is um, I learned this morning that um, the pending um, federal COVID-19 stimulus package that was agreed to last night, I think, includes $30 billion for schools. So Vermont's share of that additional state aid should be available in the current fiscal year um, to offset some of the, uh, the issues we've identified here. Um, Vermont usually receives um, the minimum payment on distributions. And if that, if that happens, I that we could receive up to $60 million, but that's, that's, um, that's not in the bank yet. Um, that's that, that we haven't seen the language. Um, and we don't know if there's any restrictions on how the money can be used or how much each state will actually receive. Um, so um, moving on to the task that um, I think you're mainly going to be talking about this morning, um, setting Hello. education. I'm sorry. What was that? George. Uh, George, I'm sorry, but Mark, did you say if we got the minimum amount from the feds, it would be 16 or 60? Which did you say? 60, 60, 6 oh. Thank you. Okay. okay. So um, moving on then, the setting education tax rate parameters, the yields, uh, the non-homestead property tax rate in FY 2020 prior to adjournment, this session is going to be problematic given the, the level of uncertainty that we, we're in right now. Uh, there is a default, um, there are default parameters um, in, in law that were put in place, I think, two years ago that would um, set the yields and the non-homestead property tax rates at the level they were in FY 2020. Um, there's been also been some discussion about um, setting the yields and the non-homestead property tax rates at the December 1 um, levels, um, but that's that's something we can discuss further. Um, so um, part of the reason we can't do much on FY21 at this point is the COVID-19 related revenue losses are expected to be significantly higher um, in FY21. And that applies not only to the non-homestead property taxes that we're, that we're losing this year, but also there's a risk that we won't collect all the education property taxes that we bill for. And reliable estimates are, are not yet available. Tom Kovett's working on this. They're looking at epidemiological models to try to get a sense of um, what we're facing over the next few weeks. And um, hopefully we'll have better information um, on FY21 soon. Um, then um, some other wrinkles in here. Um, you know, voter, voters have already gone out and approved budgets um, that are going to increase total education spending um, in FY21 by $73 million. Um, I'm not sure, um, you know, what we can do at that about that at that point. I mean, those those towns would have to revote budgets, or I'm, I'm not sure what. But um, that we, we know that there's going to be a significant um, increased demand for revenue if um, the school budgets that have been approved so far stand. 
Um, voters defeated nine school budgets in March. Five school districts, I think, um, have not yet voted and are planning to vote in April or May. When and how these votes are going to take place is now uncertain. Um, I just read in Vermont this morning that um, South Burlington proposed the revote on their bonds. So um, there's going to be a little bit of uncertainty around that for towns as well. Um, this, this, these next couple of points are important. Um, the property tax credit for FY21 is going to be based on calendar year 19 income. So there's going to be no additional property tax assistance available for taxpayers that have COVID-19 related losses of income due to layoffs or business closures. And the other side of that, and this, this is getting far out there, but I'll just point it out. That means that we're going to get a significant bump in the property tax credit in FY22 because the FY22 adjustment will be based on calendar year 2020 income, and we're expecting those incomes to fall significantly. And then the last point is that uh, moving the filing deadline from the property tax uh, for the property tax credit and the homeowner, homeowner declaration as well to um, July 15th creates a potential problem for municipalities to issue timely education property tax bills in FY 2021. I think the tax department thinks they have a handle on this, and I, I know uh, Doug Farnham's um, on this um, call, so he may want to weigh in on that, but um, it's an issue uh, that we flagged. So. Uh, can I in interrupt with a question sure. there? Um, you've talked about the fact that they may not be able to get the education bills out um, timely, but the bills are combined um, still. So municipalities are going to have trouble with their own bills as well. If it's yeah, delayed. yeah, and that you know that raises another another detail. I mean, uh, under current law, municipalities are on the hook to remit the the um, education property tax revenues that they collect to the state. So if a taxpayer is unable to pay their property tax bill in a timely fashion, the municipality is going to lose the municipal property tax collection, but they're also going to have to come up with the money unless something changes and remit um, the education tax revenue to the state. Um, municipalities administer the property tax. Um, when people don't pay, they have the, you know, they have the authority to go out and put tax liens on and that kind of thing. So the tax is very much administered locally. Um, so that that's going that could potentially create another problem for a municipality, a cash flow problem on top of a. Revenue. Is it is it possible uh, legal for a municipality to bill separately if they wanted to, so they could bill for their own municipal tax on time? I I, I don't know the answer to that um, off the top of my head. I could, we'd have to check. Um, okay. Okay. So. Thanks. So that, that's a summary of, what, of what's in the memo. Um, I go into a lot more detail on other things for people who are concerned about their individual towns and um, Thanks. You know, how much property tax they collected now. I know that um, Chloe is working on a document that um, basically um, that she pro provided that chart um, that's on page two. Um, with, so we have, we have a good idea um, of yeah. who has outstanding liabilities at this point. So uh, um, scrolling through this memo, there's a phenomenal amount of information in here. Um, and I, I don't know if people had a chance to take it in before we met. Um, let me see if there's questions from anybody. Sure. No. Um, hold on. Uh, anybody got a question? Mark, are you... Um, I, are you thinking you, you should go through the rest of your memo or um, switch to Doug Farnham at this place and come back to the other information um, when we've taken in? Yeah, I mean, if there's no questions, I mean, the, the, the summary basically is a summary of what's in the rest of it. There's more detail in there and some yeah. you know, information about how we came up with the numbers. But I think that what I've, what I've gone through so far is probably OK for now. Good. And maybe Great. it makes sense to move on to Doug. Yeah. Yep, yeah, it's a phenomenal amount of work to put all that together. Thank you, both you and Chloe. Um, all right, uh, we're going to switch to Doug Farnham. Uh, Madam Chair? Yes, Doug Hi, how are you? I'm doing well. Um, Good. Just, in, just out of habit, Doug Farnham, Deputy Commissioner for Tax, for the record. <laughs> right. I think we're streaming, so we're probably okay there, but. Thank you, um, I appreciate it. And you're not on video, right? We have- I on. am not not using video at the moment, no, Madam All Chair. Right. Okay, good. Um, so go ahead. Um. 
All right. I, I don't have a, a great deal of um, prepared material. I didn't share a document for today, um, but was hoping to, you know, provide the committee with answers to any questions they might have. I know there were a couple of issues during Mr. Peralt's presentation uh, that I could start with as well. Um, one thing I would say is that uh, the issue of whether or not municipalities can now bill separately Yep. Um, I would say that under at least my reading, and it would be much better to have, you know, ledge council's interpretation of this, but under my reading of 5402B2, the changes that were made two years ago um, to the tax billing template, they changed it so that um, it now says that the education tax may be billed on the same sheet with municipal. Um, meaning I would interpret that to mean that if the towns chose to bill separately for municipal, they now have the option where they did not in the past. Uh, that, that depending on how things happen, that may be helpful. Right. I think that I at least think that would give them the option to, to send their own bills, uh, to collect the municipal portion. Um, if, if the, uh, homestead is not, um, information is just not complete and not available for them to do a proper billing of that tax. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, to speak to the, the uh, delays, the deferrals, um, basically the blanket forgiveness of penalty and interest recently announced by Commissioner Bolio, I would say that um, at this point, um, our main intention at the department was to relieve some stress and let people know that you know, the, the upcoming due date for this month, you know, that actually was today and for next month on April 25th, that they did not have to make those due dates um, and, and fear penalty and interest if they missed those due dates. I think as things settle down, hopefully there is some settling over the next couple of months, we'll definitely be um, considering messaging on encouraging, especially larger filers to continue remitting people that um, we believe have the capacity to continue remitting and filing, um, encouraging them to do so. And, um, and our hope is that, that we would have those catch up periods before the end of the fiscal year. Um, but I think that also depends on how, how this crisis continues to play out, whether or not additional deferrals would be granted or not. Um, so I think that's still something we have to keep an eye on and monitor closely. Doug, um, I had thought that this applied to sales tax as well as rooms and meals. Am I wrong about that? Uh, you are not incorrect, Madam Chair. It does apply to both sales tax and to meals and rooms tax. And thought. of course, the, the major exposure to the Ed Fund is from the sales tax, which is roughly $30 million a month uh, at this time of year. Right. So that's a, that's a very big impact in fiscal 20 and in fiscal 21 if they're there's if they never pay if it turns out that they can't pay um for whatever right. all right thanks go ahead then um, um so i think the the major impacts of of the delay of the federal income tax filing and in the for the income taxes and the way that flows through to the homestead declarations. Of course, um, the department will not have a complete file of homestead declarations. Um, uh, we don't anticipate having a complete file before the 15th of July. And then of course we would need time to process. But what I can say is that in the, sh in the short term, what, we're what we'd be focusing on is um, during the filing season, we transmit homestead declarations to the towns on a weekly basis, and we would be continuing to transmit those. So we'd be monitoring to see which towns are coming close to having um, the historical amount of homestead declarations filed. Um, if this, if this um, pandemic, if we do manage to get it under control and things start to normalize, um, in May and June, I think it might be appropriate for us to start encouraging more people to file their homestead declarations, even though the due date is on July 15th, uh, getting some messaging out, letting them know it would, it would be very helpful if they could file early. Um, I think it's a little bit premature for, for that type of messaging at this point, but I think that's a message we definitely want to have on the board and ready to go out, um, hopefully in May and June. 
Uh, and that might help mitigate the impact of this where if we're able to get towns uh, substantially complete, then we might be able to get close to that traditional July 1 calendar. Um, and we could even consider, you know, messaging that's targeted or focused on those towns that, that bill early and have traditionally relied on that July billing to start the, the cash flow starting in August. Um, that would help us, you know, if we're not just blanketing the whole state, but if we're focusing on those towns and letting them know they can help their town out by filing that declaration, um, we might be able to move the process along um, without any leg legal changes, uh, but just a little bit of outreach and education on our end. You know how many uh, homestead declarations have already been filed? Um, the last I looked, it was uh, right around 70,000. Sorry, I know my keyboard's loud. I was just gonna type in to look it up, but um, it's right around 70,000. So it most likely hasn't shifted much off that number. Out of a total of? 170,000. Um, okay. and then 100, yeah. 120,000 of those have the additional layer of the property tax credit. Um, the homestead declaration is of course important because mostly important for people avoiding the penalty of filing late and for towns where the homestead rate is significantly different. But in my opinion, at least for most people, the property tax credit claim is the more financially substantive impact. Um, and that's the document that, um, we need to make sure we have those in and processed. And of course they have more errors and more issues that we have to work through. Right. Um, let, let me pause for a second and see if members have questions. Uh, anyone wanna get clarification from Doug? Jim, Jim has a question. Yeah, go ahead, Jim. I see it unmuted. Jim, can you start over? Okay. So filing for homestead declaration is July 15th, which is the same as filing our income taxes. Um, there's a question that's came up locally about filing for income sensitivity. Is the drop dead date for that still in September? October. Right. So um, the dates in law for that, um, again, this is pulling from memory, but the dates are specific at October 15th. It's not phrased as a six month extension from the due date. So I would say that yes, the, the drop dead date for that is, is still at this point, October 15th. Okay, thank you, that's the clarification. Thank you. Okay, uh, let me see if there's anyone else with a question. No. I don't think so. Um, I, think so Mark, uh, I think Mark wanted to say something. Oh, I'm sorry, Mark, go ahead. Um, uh, do you mind if I address a question to Doug? Um, no, of course not. Okay, so um, I was unaware that the sales tax um, collections were also gonna be deferred. And I just note that the last payment to, to the school districts for the fiscal year is due on April 30th. And that payment includes not only the um, education payment, but also one third of the categorical aid that goes out to schools for special education, transportation, small schools, that kind of thing. And I'm wondering if delaying the um, collection dates for the sales and use and the meals and rooms tax until June is going to create a cash flow um, problem for the education fund. Doug, you want to weigh in? Are you there, Doug? Muted. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Let's unmute you. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Now we're unmuted. Um, sorry, I haven't been involved in the cash flow discussions. I think that's an excellent uh, question, and I can make sure that um, uh, primarily AOE. Agency of Education monitors the cash flow, and I think that's a great question to raise, Mark. Um, what one thing we I did say, you know, sales tax is thirty million dollars, um, but the majority of that sales tax is raised through larger sellers, and many of those um, are actually 
not experiencing a downtick in business, um, particularly in the remote sales sector. Um, so we will be running an analysis on the sales tax returns as soon as they're through our system um, and trying to get a picture of, okay, what exactly did this deferral, um, how much money did it actually shift? Um, in our analysis to this point, we've been doing worst case, you know, assuming that no one's going to pay and everyone's going to shift it back. But um, I think for March, we, we already got about half of the $30 million uh, from people that had, had already filed early. Um, so it, it won't cost us the full amount of, of revenue that we would expect. And, and we're gonna try to refine that as quickly as possible. Um, and then uh, make sure that AOE has that for the cash flow and impact analysis. I think that uh, particularly if uh, the decision to defer causes a cash flow issue, I think our next step at the tax department would be to reach out to particularly larger vendors, um, larger businesses that we believe should still have the capacity to file and remit those taxes and um, encourage them to do so. Or uh, the commissioner actually does have the discretion to remove the forgiveness for those particular taxpayers um, because it, it could have been structured, structured as a, you know, a capped deferral. Um, but in, in, um, I guess I would say we can make adjustments as necessary. Anybody want to jump in? Any hands raised? So, Doug, I'm just going to uh, underscore a concern uh, that I think many of us have is that this is not just a cash flow question, but if businesses are asked to pay three months when they can't pay two or four months when they can't pay two, we also have a uh, potentially large loss of revenue, which is basically just going to flow to property taxpayers. Um, so I want to underscore that concern. I think that's a very legitimate concern, Madam Chair. Um, and I think that the risk of, of not just of a portion of the deferred revenue um, going into default, essentially, um, I think that it would be very fair to quantify that as part of a, of a fiscal analysis going forward that, that um, while we felt like the deferral was the right thing to do to help Vermonters through this crisis, it does add an increased layer of risk on, on, on the financial end for the state. Anyone else wanna jump in? Anything else you wanna add, Doug? Um, I would just add that in particular with uh, the billing in, in July and August, um, we're going to be continuing discussions with the League of Cities and Towns. We're very sensitive to doing everything we can um, to limit the disruptions to the towns because of all of the other impacts the towns are likely to face. Um, so I think we'll be continuing to come up with strategies from my initial take is that we should have the discretion to mitigate the situation without asking for something in a bill. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm very hopeful that we'll be able to, to minimize the impact of the calendar shifts to the towns. And um, at this point, we don't have a request for, for any particular new authority or anything as far as, that, as far as that July and August billing goes. Can you tell me what you mean by mitigate the effects? Um, I, I, don't, I don't know what you're talking about, uh, what you might be talking about. Can you be more clear? Yes. So traditionally, and we do still have in law that um, we have to transmit the property tax credit claims by July 1st. So we will comply with that. We'll transmit everyone who has filed and um, is timely. Uh, well, is actually ahead of the due date at that point. Um, is part of our essential services plan. We'll be continuing, we've set up examiners to be able to function remotely. Um, so we'll have a good portion of our staff working remotely processing uh, homestead declarations and property tax credit claims from home. And we'll continue to get those through so that we won't run into a situation where we get to July and our staff has been working remotely and we have a huge backlog. That's what we're 
we're working actively to avoid that. We have more than half the department working remote right now. So we're going to make sure that we have those credit claims and those homestead declarations processed so that even if we do get to the July 15th timeline, we don't uh, due date, we don't have a deadline and we're hope, hopeful that we'll be public, uh, processing a small number at that point. I did just pull uh, the most recent figure is 78,000 homestead declarations okay. as of last night. Um, yeah. So as we get closer to May and June, if, if things are starting to level out a bit on the coronavirus, we would message, you know, encourage people to file those forms um, so that we can get the property tax bills going. And as we get closer to July, we would likely focus additional messaging on those 70, approximately 70 towns that bill in July and do our best to help them, help the residents of those towns get the paperwork in so that those towns can bill. Um, it's something we don't have absolute control over, but I think that we can, um, I think that we can get very close to the mark without any changes in law. Um, and I think that any changes in law in this area would be very disruptive, I think, in the long term and, and wouldn't really gain us very much from what we're able to do on our own. Okay, thank you. Let me see if there's questions. I don't think so. Uh, uh, Doug, thank you. Um, uh, very much. And um, we're going to hear from the league. I don't know if you, yeah, I know you've been in conversation with them, but you're welcome, obviously, to listen in if that would be helpful. So, um. Janet, I don't think that Karen has called in yet. I know oh. that Jeff Francis is on. Uh, uh, and so is Sue Saglowski from the School Boards Association. So, why don't we move to her? Is Sue on now? Yep. Yeah. Uh, was anyway. I'm not seeing her on my list. She's at the bottom and she's muted. There she goes, unmuted. I just unmuted myself, thank you. Excellent. All right, welcome. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. This is my first time testifying to your committee. I'm the um, newish executive director for the Vermont School Boards Association. Right. I, I don't have a prepared material to give you this morning, but just wanted to give you um, just a brief update on on what's happening at on our end. Um, I would just say that Vermont's education community is sharply focused on the urgent issues that are posed by this pandemic. And it's really an all hands on deck situation um, with very long hours and new issues that are coming up by the hour. Um, the information that was presented by Mark Peral is obviously um, very concerning. The VSBA is working to support school boards in their role in responding to the coronavirus and um, making sure that they are staying connected with their superintendent, um, who is their chief executive officer of their district and um, is, is the designated um, person in the chain of command to really make um, the most urgent decisions that need to be made at this time. Um, so if you, I, I think Jeff Francis will be able to fill you in on a few more operational um, questions. Uh, I would just say that the, the, the three areas that are being focused on right now are school meals, which many are being delivered um, by, by school bus or at designated locations, um, child care for essentially employees, and then um, transitioning to some type of online or remote learning or, or paper packets um, for students. Um, so if, you, if there are any questions that you have, I'm, I'm happy to answer them or happy to gather any information for you that um, you think will be helpful to your committee. Great, let me, <coughs> excuse me, let me see if, if anyone has questions. Um, Pardon me. Um, I don't see anyone with their hand raised except Robin. There she is. Okay. Go ahead, Robin. Thanks. I guess I have to wave bigger. Well, um, I, I slide by. So just so I slide them across the top here. And oh. if I am at the other end, I don't see you. I see. I okay. Back. I'm on gallery view. So I've, I see everybody. Um, so I learned last night that my school district is having um, a very difficult time standing up child care for essential workers. The other school districts in Addison County are set up, but 
Addison Central has not been able to because the private childcare organizations have all said they would not be able to help out. Is this, are you finding this around the state or is this just us or what, what happens when they can't set up some childcare? Well, I think it, it definitely is variable from district to district. And uh, I know I listened in on um, two superintendents who are testifying to the Senate Ed Committee yesterday. And um, even in, they were both working through the situation and able to do it, um, but there was concern about the sustainability of, um, of it um, because of less people being able to provide the care due to concerns for their own health or actually um, the fear that some people will um, be sick and not be able to provide the care. Uh, when Jeff testifies, he may be able to give you a little bit more information. Okay, so people are actually allowed to opt out of providing this. I guess I didn't, that didn't strike home till last night. I would take a look at the AOE guidance. I don't, I, I can't tell you right now that they're able to opt out of doing that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let me see if there's other questions. Scott, you're all set. You're a little hidden for me, but. Okay. All right, uh, thank you very much. It's nice to meet you in this kind of odd way, but um, but um, appreciate your being available and we'll continue to uh, um, welcome your input if you have other things that you wanna share with us. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to move, I guess, to Jeff uh, Francis now. I still don't see whether Karen is on, but let's talk with Jeff anyway. Good morning. Morning, Jeff. Um, thank you for um, allowing us to participate this morning. <clears throat> I can follow up on what Sue Siglowski said a little bit. Um, I think it's fair to say that since the couple of days before the decision was made to close schools, all uh, educators and particularly the folks that I work with, with the superintendents and their staffs have been going um, long hours at high rates of speed in order to try to contend with all the changes. And I know that you all have a full appreciation for that um, because you're both participating in it and witnessing it. Um, I have started to pay attention to the type of information that Mark provided, although I will say that I found his briefing extraordinarily useful to contextualize um, where we are right now and where we will be headed. Um, although that briefing paper is marked draft, I do intend to send that out to superintendents today because I think as they contend with the core services that Sue Siglowski um, spoke of, which are maintenance of learning, childcare, and I do have information on that, providing meals, and I would, and I would add a fourth even though it's not among the formal order from the governor, and that is trying to stay on top of the tremendous array of information and more specifically, the changes to that information that are affecting what school districts do on a daily basis. So um, your colleagues in the House Education Committee are gonna talk Friday afternoon with six superintendents from around the state in order to get an update on um, how things are going in terms of the immediate provision of education and the four areas of focus that they're organizing their testimony into are, as I said, a continuity of learning, um, providing food services, which has been a, um, it's been a, um, I would say societally a gratifying process to watch because these schools who are adept at providing food have figured out all forms of creative ways to continue to do so through this period of crisis. The third is childcare. And as Representative Shu asked, 
that is a lot less um, consistent to place from place to place. And the reason is because although school districts work with kids, they, they in many instances are not in the childcare business. So I think that the administration correctly recognized that if we were gonna continue to provide supports for essential workers, you needed to combine forces between the private childcare providers and the public schools because on a region to region basis, the delivery of those services um, uh, play out or are provided differently. What we're seeing is that um, as the um, realities and perceptions of the crisis magnify, it's harder and harder to get people to come to work understandably. So in guidance that Secretary French just sent out moments ago. Um, he talks about the fact that childcare for essential persons is an, an, an essential service under the addendum that was issued by the governor yesterday. But he acknowledges in that communication that the stay at home order um, significantly disrupts the ability to operate these services. So the, the order that came or the, the clarification that came from Secretary French just moments ago includes this phrase, school districts may continue to operate these programs on a voluntary basis based on community need. Um, so there is a, an evenness around the state. I think that um, it's a challenge that uh, many, many people are constructively engaged in, but it's gonna continue to be a big challenge um, as, we, as we all work together to navigate this. And then the fourth um, category that these superintendents are organizing their comments around goes to what they refer to as other stressors. Um, and the other stressors provision includes topics like how to contend, and, and some of these I wanna just say are, uh, I think in the total scope of the challenge, they're not all created equally. But some of the things they cite, uh, which the General Assembly is already trying to respond to, is how school boards govern through this period. Um, the fact that many school employment uh, situations and circumstances and requirements are contractual by nature. So there's a major um, workforce, um, all of whom are affected by this, um, the outbreak in different ways, um, employee anxiety, um, as, as a lot of responsibility has fallen on the school system. So I, I won't persist in that explanation, but as you can imagine, I'm sure, um, since the, um, the governor uh, um, proclaimed the first emergency, it's been really rapid response, rapid change, trying to get organized and contend with a multitude of issues that um, school districts have not had experience contending with before. Um, the fact that they operated as school systems gave them some contextual expertise in terms of how to work with systems and personnel. But this, as you know, is something that they haven't um, experienced. Um, so, uh, you know, I, as you know, we're going to go through a period of transition. I think that as folks get organized, um, even as uh, demands increase and change, I think it's appropriate that, that school leaders in particular work with the sources of information that they have, like the General Assembly, and get ready for the, for the days ahead. Um, so those are some general comments. I can answer any questions. Um, I could also talk about... Um, some of the cost stressors that um, that schools are um, experiencing, but I'm not sure that you need to use your committee's time to do that. Although I do have a lot of anecdotal information that I've collected about what superintendents in particular are thinking about. So <laughs> I'm gonna just see if there's questions about what you've said so far. I think I might like to spend a couple minutes on the cost stress stressors because um, those are all things that affect the revenue that's needed. But um, before I look around for questions, I just want to acknowledge what you 
said about schools being on the front line here and um, how amazingly quickly you've had to adapt and improvise and innovate and everything else um, with probably one of the most, um, well, next to healthcare at the moment, the most important government function that we've got. Um, and I've got grandkids who are affected by this. I know we all have family members who are, and um, it's, a, it's a really major undertaking. Um, let me see if I've got questions uh, from anyone. Here, I've got Jim Maslin there. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, um, Jeff, um, you're aware, I'm sure, and I'm just adding a little comment that some kids are very good auditory learners, others more kinesthetic, others more visual. And I commend you for anything any of the schools can do to try to adapt to different students, different learning styles. Yeah, my response to that is, you know, um, as uh, your chair, Representative Ansel pointed out, um, the folks that are, I mean, I, I, I can't tell you how impressed I am with everybody who's working in the education system. So I'm closely connected to 52 superintendents <laughs> and I start to get email communications at 5.30 in the morning and it's going to 11.30 at night. It's, I'm, I'm, I'm doing my best to be very, very responsive to all of them, but you know, they all operate in different ways. And and um, they are they have turned into this in extraordinary ways. I'll leave it there. I also am starting to see examples of work that is reflective of the um, importance of continuity of learning that is illustrative of the fact that um, that many, many, many teachers have a really close connection to their classrooms and their kids. So these folks are true public servants. And they're doing a le their level best at a time when, quite frankly, they're, many of them are frightened. Um, so that's a story, I think, that will be told um, in the future. With regard to the particular learning style question, the Principals Association and there's an association of um, curriculum leaders in addition to the NEA, I think are going to start to um, roll out more um useful approaches in terms of staying connected with kids in what now appears to be uh, a more prolonged period of learning at home um, so there's great reasons to um, celebrate the contributions of educators and families with regard to these kids that stated there are also um, tremendous areas of concern right so not every child um, in this state comes from a healthy home background. Um, the socioeconomic um, disparities in the state are stark. Um, the ability to convey um, uh, learning um, uh, when kids are not in school in some ways is relying on technological capacity. So I won't persist here, but you know, if you if you just took a step back and said, how complex can this be? I think that we, all of us, including myself, probably have a tendency to understate the complexity of it. Okay. Let's see if there's other questions. Um, no, good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, oops, I'm getting a feedback again. Um, so I think Sersha asked if we could take a, uh, I don't know how long a break, a 10 minute break, is that right? Is that what Janet, you? I think Karen is trying to call in right now. If we could just um, give her a moment. Oh, okay. It, you don't want you don't didn't want to do a pause. Then you want to do the you want to switch to Karen. Um, if she can make it in, what do you think? Uh, that's fine. Um, okay. Let's give yeah. her. Okay, seconds. Jeff. Um, I want to thank you, um, and I expect we'll um, probably be needing to. Uh, talk to you again. Um, I really, I, I want you to convey the appreciation that we have um, to the folks that you work with. Well, likewise, back to you. And if it, if you, if you want me at some point to talk about the observations from the field yep. in terms of the concerns of uh, observations they have about the, those cost stressors, I'm yep. happy to 
go up. I think I think I, I would probably like to reschedule that. Uh, um, I'm I'm going to get crushed for time because no, of no the, problem that we're going to be on the floor. But um, but let Thanks let for allowing me to join you. I'm going to stand by and listen. Great, thank you. Okay, so we're going to try to get Karen in. It looks like Joey has a question. Uh, Joey, go ahead. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. I, I just was um, actually wanted to ask Robin how she gets to the gallery where she sees everybody. How do we do that in this Zoom? Well, on, on mine, it's the upper right-hand corner. Um, if you move your um, mouse around and up in the right hand corner mine says speaker view now but it if because oh. that's because i'm on gallery but there's like nine little dots okay i don't i know i don't have that it, it, it well we'll have uh Sersha give you a call and see if you if all she right can thank you i don't i didn't mean to interrupt but i thought oh, that was time I, so, I so dearly want to see all those beautiful faces <laughs> of the ways and means committee yours might be on the bottom too not every computer set up the yeah, same yeah i sort of looked i've sort of looked around I think. thanks Robert. we are going to get better every time <laughs> we're yes and janet did i were you were we going to have some sort of um tutorial in remote voting Yes, we yes, were. We were. And, um, that, at the moment, at the moment that's waiting, that's waiting. Uh, uh, because, because we, we, we need, to, need to. I've got a feed. I've got a feed. Okay. It's, it's Joey's. It's oh, me? Joey. Oh, Joey. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Um, um, Joey, if you Joey, if you mute. Mute? Yes, mute. Okay. Yes, mute. All right. I am on mute. Uh, no, uh, no, no. Now you are. Now. Okay, good. All right. Um, we were going to do the training. Um, we decide they're not ready to do it. And it has to do with the remote voting that the is going to be the subject of the uh, discussion at one o'clock on the floor. So, um, so we, we will get to that. Sorry, I didn't, I mentioned it yesterday and forgot to say it wasn't going to happen today. Janet, uh, Karen is on now. Great. Okay, Karen. Uh, See if I can find you on my list here, but uh, welcome to the committee. Uh, we're glad you were able to get through to us. Um, and thank you. Ready to uh, ready to listen. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Everybody good? All right. Okay, so um, thank you very much for, for taking the time. Um, I did send the committee an, an updated memo just, I think, about an hour ago um, from the schoolyard. Thank goodness for schoolyards and hotspots. <laughs> um, and so the, the, um, it sort of goes through what kind of um, reduced revenues towns are anticipating, um, what our increased needs are, uh, what we see as some of the statutory issues. Um, bonding and then what to do. So I'd like to go through those if I can. That'd be great, thank you. Okay, so uh, cities and towns are expecting reduced revenues um, from more than the normal number of requests for abatement of property taxes and fees. So the fees would be fees for wastewater, um, water supply, any of those kinds of things that are user fee based. Um, and uh, the argument um, would generally be hardship or that taxes are, quote, manifestly unjust in the face, unjust in the face of this recession, the upcoming recession. Um, they're expecting late payment of tax and fees in addition to requests for abatement. They're expecting increased delinquencies on property tax payments um, and fees again. And then um, there, there's the possibility that properties would meet sort of your general under normal circumstances qualifications for tax sale. And the town's going to have to um, address that. And we anticipate that select boards 
will need to modify their general policy on tax sales in this situation. And even after, probably after the emergency declaration is over, because there is going to be a tail on people's inability to pay. And and then we uh, expect that there will be a lot more grievances of property values, again, based on reductions due to a likely recession. Um, towns and cities are also anticipating significantly reduced revenues from local option taxes, which is the same situation that, that you had presented to you yesterday um, regarding the state's uh, sales, meals and rooms, alcohol taxes. Um, we have heard from small businesses that they're going to need to choose between making payroll or paying um, sales, meals, rooms, and alcohol taxes for the previous month, that would be February. And then when they choose payroll, this is not necessarily a municipal issue, but something that we're hearing about at the local level. But when they choose to pay payroll, um, they'll be in arrears on taxes that are payable to the state. Um, are you still hearing me? Yes, I do. Okay, yes. okay, okay. Just checking. Right. Um, and if you want to, if you want to pause, why don't you've got another couple paragraphs? Why don't I pause there and see if there's questions? Okay. So you go ahead and finish this this section. Oh, okay. Sorry. That's so a um, then, towns and cities, um, uh, as I mentioned, increase will expect increased grievances of property values. Um, when the property market takes a downturn, um, that might be happening already. I'm not really sure. Um, generally speaking, under ordinary circumstances, hearings for grievances need to be held by June 19th in towns of fewer than 5,000 population and by July 9th for towns of more than 5,000 population. Um, I think those are some deadlines that are likely to move. Um, and then as a result of um, severely reduced revenues, towns and cities are going to need to borrow likely in anticipation of taxes. And that is designed to be short-term borrowing, but it may be necessary to borrow for an extended period of time. And towns will need to repay those loans with interest, um, again, having pretty uh, significant ramifications for the municipal budget. Uh, we hear from the bond bank, Michael Gone, that um, municipal capital markets are shut down and that banks are really the only option for towns to borrow right now. And they're also the only option for anybody else who wants to borrow. So um, we're not sure, A, what kind of lines of credit might be out there or how long they might be available for. Uh, we understand, again, from Michael Gone that um, right now the Vermont banks say that they're in fairly good shape, but we kind of anticipate that they'll be in good shape until they aren't. Um, and, and also, we're not really sure what the total municipal need might be for short-term financing. Uh, we are working with Michael and with uh, State Treasurer Beth Pierce to try and get a better fix on that. We're um, going to be querying towns about what they think. But of course, it's just going to be an estimate um, because really no, no one knows what the full impact um, will be or how long this situation is going to last. It could be quite some time. So I will pause there. Pause there. Good. I'm just scrolling through to see whether uh, people have questions. Um, anyone want to jump in? No, I think no questions at the moment, Karen. So why don't you continue? Okay. So I. Um, the next section has to do with increased needs and just to sort of give the committee a picture of what we are looking at. 
Um, cities and towns are obligated to continue to provide water and wastewater services despite non-payment of bills. Uh, that was re-emphasized in the bill that the Senate passed yesterday. I think it was just yesterday. These days are long. Um, law enforcement presence is recommended to be highly visible in communities for those towns that have law enforcement um, or that are uh, working with the sheriff's department. That That's kind of a recommendation from the public safety um, department at the state. Uh, and then emergency medical services, as I'm sure you all are very well aware, are incredibly stressed right now. Uh, costs will likely increase in order to provide protective equipment, provide timely response to calls. We hope that we can keep that up and to um, assure that staffing is sufficient when the need is there. Uh, we are enacting mutual aid agreements between towns. Uh, most of our towns are insured by the VLCT Property and Casualty Liability Insurance Fund. And so uh, it would be very easy for a mutual aid agreement to be uh, signed amongst all of those communities and in insurance would not be a problem. Our, we do have a sample mutual aid agreement that is on our website that is written fairly broadly so that any town, um, whether in or not in passive, would be able to uh, have assurance that there would be coverage when that was necessary. And then um, we're being asked, well, towns are being asked what they're doing currently around landlord and tenant issues. It's interesting that this was a big issue in the legislature um, just a couple of weeks ago around rental housing and um, town health officers and, and what um, they were being able to do. I think town health officers and municipal boards of health are also going to be asked to address a number of issues related to the whole um, public health crisis that we've got going on now and we sort of don't know exactly what all that will look like and then um, we just have your ordinary business needs that need to be met uh, as well as payments for outstanding bonds that they already have lease payments matching funds for grants and and things like things like that. So I, ju I did just kind of want to give you a picture of what it's looking like at the local level right now. I don't know if there are questions about that. Well, let me go look and see. Um, I don't see anybody, but I'm going to scroll down here. Nope. Okay, go ahead. All right. So um, you've heard about some of these statutory issues already from Commissioner Bolio um, and uh, Mark Pearl, Steve Klein and Graham. Uh, firstly, as a result of the filing deadlines for income taxes moving to July 15th, the filing deadline for homestead declarations is also moved to July 15th. Uh, we have about 70 towns that have filing deadlines remaining for this current year. So we have um, some towns have like a May 1 or June 1 payment on the last installment of their uh, property taxes. And as you discussed yesterday, if a town got, if a town's payment date, for instance, was October 1 or, or November 1, they're in good shape. But if they had installments that are extending April, May, June, there's gonna be problems with that. And then um, for the new fiscal year, ordinarily the tax department sends out the grand lists and, and um, homestead um, and tax rates uh, July 1, and they're not even gonna be getting the homestead filings until July 15th. So that sort of bumps everything and a lot of towns actually have their first installment payment in July. So. That, that whole timeline is going to need to be massaged um, and towns are gonna to need some authority, which I think they may have, maybe have in the um, Senate bill that was passed 
yesterday. We need to look a little more closely at that. But I do think that is something they'll be able to do. In any case, it's going to, um, it's just going to sort of compound the issue of uh, reduced revenues overall when you're um, also anticipating getting revenues later than um, ordinarily. And so then the town has to borrow again longer in order to um, make up the difference uh, in their borrowing unit. Yeah. Um, just a couple questions. Um, what uh, what is it in the Senate bill that you were referring to um, that you thought was in there? I didn't follow what you so, were saying. Oh, I'm sorry. So there is a section in the Senate bill. I don't have it right in front of me right now, but that allows municipalities to um, uh, to um, move deadlines for things during this particular crisis. And it talks about licenses, permits, and um, I forget what the third word is, but um, I, I will send you that okay. language to take a look at it. It's not, it's very general language. It's not specific to um, financial issues. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. And it, and it, and it also says that municipalities may move those deadlines for only municipal um, matters, right? So if it's a state deadline for a permit or whatever, we have no ability to address that. It's just for municipal, so. And then my other question, um, I don't know if you heard me asking Mark earlier, uh, or Doug, I guess it was, um, if, if, the, if we're uh, late, you know, if we, if we don't have the information together to do the education tax billing until, uh, I don't know, July, August, or whatever. Um, is it uh, possible, I, I think it's legal, but I don't know if it's functionally possible for the municipality to issue a tax bill for the municipal tax on your, you know, early enough, so at least your cash flow on the municipal tax isn't affected. Is that something that you're looking at? That's something that we've talked about and has been suggested to us by a few towns. Uh -huh. um, and I think that that would make sense. Um, I'm not sure if um, that, I'm not sure if the law allows for that right now. We and, think and it Mark, does. Or, yeah, we think it you does. You think it does. Yeah, we're not okay. sure, but we think it does. Um, if it doesn't, we can make it possible. Um, and then the question right. is whether you can functionally do it. Um, but it would be, it, you don't you don't need to have your municipal tax slowed down by the fact that we're slow. Right, right. Well, that would be, um, I mean, that would be awesome. <laughs> and, and and so then the question that I need to put out to the um, to the towns is is it is it feasible? I think it is, but um, I mean, I'm just saying that right now. But it seems to me that it would be, but you'd be sending out an extra set of tax bills. But in the long Which might also be confusing to to people um, who think that they're paying their, you know, their property tax. But I think those are issues that can be surmounted. Okay, good. Thank you. Other questions committee members have? I'm going to look through the list here, see if anybody is raising their hand. Nope. Not what I see. Okay. Go ahead, Karen. I'm Okay, so, so the next thing that I have in that memo, and just before I got on the phone, I was corrected by a couple of towns. Um, the statute requires towns and cities turn over one half the education property tax to the agency, well, to the state, um, June 1 and half December 1. So um, I should know this. Mark may know this, but um, so towns send their education dollars, which are not the full vote that goes to a school, but they send their education tax dollars to the school, not to the state. Is Mark, that right? Want to jump in? Whoops, you're, you're muted. <laughs> anyway, oh. He's out, okay. Nope. Um, so yeah, can, can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Um, so I, I was told by um, 
a, a couple of towns just before I got on the call that they actually send their education property taxes directly to the school, to their school. They don't send them to the state. Yeah, it's it's actually the the, the towns that are only uh, are able to raise less than their school spends will raise the money, bank it, and then send it to their um, school districts on um, three dates that are set forth in law. The only towns that make a payment directly into the education fund, as far as I know, are those towns that raise more on their homestead and non-homestead property tax than their school spend. Okay, so do they, um, I should know this, I'm sorry to take your time right now, but um, do those schools that pay more than their um, school budget, do they send to their school and to the State, yes, I believe I they... believe so. Yeah, they they'll they'll send they'll okay. send what, what their schools need from the education payment, and then the remainder goes back um, to the education fund in those two payments. I think those two payments differ from the other ones because towns that were able to raise more money um, are able to bank that money and you know use it for cash flow and collect interest on it and that kind of things. And um, that was put in when Act sixty first passed, I think. Okay, thank you. So. In any case, there there are penalties for not sending your education property tax dollars where they need to go <laughs> on time, and that's a um, a considerable concern for municipalities uh, right now because they're not going to be able to make up um, the difference if they're if they're receiving you know less money from in property taxes overall. So that's a, an issue. And then um, if towns stabilize taxes right now, they need to make the education fund whole. Um, and uh, again, that would be really difficult for um, towns to do. And, and that's why you actually don't see a lot of general, generally don't see a lot of tax stabilization on the part of towns for uh, property taxes altogether. So then, um, uh, are, do we want to stop there? Uh, I, I'm going to pause and see if people have questions. No, I don't think so. Go ahead. Yep. Okay. So then just a, a, a couple of thoughts with respect to bonding. Um, towns and cities, there were quite a few of them that did pass bond votes on town meeting day, which um, amazingly is only a couple of weeks ago. And um, they, those are mostly for infrastructure projects, uh, wastewater upgrades, water supply, those kinds of things. Um, they do, so they receive the authority to borrow on town meeting day. They're not obligated to actually go out and do the borrowing within any specific um, period of time. And um, in fact, right now, I don't think they'd be able to but neither would they want to because the markets are so um, volatile. And again, the revenues are, are sort of uncertain, uh, the municipal revenues to pay back those bonds. So I think that even if your town did um, pass a bond on town meeting day, uh, no action is going to be taken for quite some time. And then um, what to do and uh, these are just some thoughts, uh, and one that I did not put in there was what you mentioned, um, Madam Chair, about se billing separately for municipal and education taxes. Uh, we do think there there needs to we need to somehow figure out what to do about homestead filings in July 15th. Um, Commissioner Bolio and I sort of discussed last evening whether a public outreach campaign asking people to file if they were able, file their homestead declaration if they were able, um, would help with some of that issue. Another uh, possibility might be if you are not changing your status from last year's homestead declaration that you might in this year might not need to file again. Um, I guess there have been some difficulties with that in the past that the commissioner could discuss with the committee, but that might be be a way to uh, get most of the homestead um, status before the July 15th deadline. And then, so um, 
one suggestion also, uh, cause we, we asked, um, we're thinking that towns will get asked to abate both school taxes and um, the municipal taxes. And one suggestion is that if towns were allowed to do that, they would only be allowed to abate an education tax in the same proportion and for the same period of time as the municipal tax. And that's just a thought at this point. I know it's pretty radical, but um, we're, uh, we'd be sort of interested in what the committee thought about that idea. And then um, making sure that if education property taxes are not paid due to delinquencies, um, the, the law uh, emphasizes that the town isn't obligated to make the education fund whole. I think that the statute says, I should say, I'm not a lawyer, but I've got back up in the office. Um, I think that the statute says that if there's non-payment of taxes, municipalities um, uh, pay, put the dollars into the municipal tax first and the education tax second. But again, I would defer to Mark on or whoever on, on that front in terms of what it says now. And then finally, um, I'm, I give you the link to our uh, frequently asked questions on financial issues during COVID-19. We just put this particular document up on our website yesterday. And then we do have a page um, on our website for COVID-19 issues. And we've got frequently asked questions about um, a number of, of different uh aspects of this whole situation, open meeting, public records, human resources, and those kinds of things. And if you're uh, curious, uh, feel free to go there and look those up. Uh, Karen, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, Abby Shepard just sent me um, an email uh, basically agreeing with Doug Farnham about the, um, the uh, legality of having the towns do separate bills and I forwarded it to you Karen so that you can look at oh that. excellent thank um, you and then, you know I, I see this is not not simple but it might be something that would be useful so uh, opportunity right. for discussion um, let me see if there's questions from anybody on the committee um, no no questions okay um, so Karen, thank you. Um, I know towns are um, having to deal with a tremendous amount. I've, I've heard from all my, my towns about the challenges and um, appreciate how hard this is and how, uh, how much people are working to try to keep things functioning. So, uh, thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, I will stay on the call, but I'll mute myself. Um, okay, I, I think um, as exciting as it may be, we may be shifting to provider tax. So, um, so. Oh, okay. Never mind then. <laughs> welcome to stay if you want. Um, but let me let me check with Sorsha and see where things are. Uh, so, what I'd like to do is stop the live stream. Everybody can stay on the call and then mute your video and your sound, and then we'll return. I don't know, Janet, at eleven forty-five. With the provider tax or 1140 yeah. so so jen is here are we waiting for her or I, are we i don't have any of the documents okay um, okay so, so i need a moment to get set up perfect we will do a pause don't hang up please because it takes a while to get people back on so just mute stop your video and mute and we'll be back in how long uh sorsha um 11 40. 11 40. okay thank you see you on a minute um, this afternoon about, or tonight, or whenever, tomorrow, as soon as we can, about what we're doing and how to call in. Um, so if we could go ahead and get started, um, Jen or Nolan, I'm not sure which of you um, wants to, uh, we're only looking at the provider tax, but unless there's other tax issues in the bill, but that's the one that I'm uh, most focused on. Okay. Hi, this is Jen. Um, I think I'm unmuted. Um, so yes, I think the main question that affects this committee is the provider tax, which is now section two. Um, 
And I'm trying, just trying to think of the differences from what you sent over. So the, well, uh, understand that the committee never really had the provider tax in front of it because that happened, if you remember, sort of last minute um, in another bill. So if you could, I think we got briefed, but we didn't really do a lot of work on it. That's right. Okay. Um, Great. So good point. Remind us the status of the bill. So it's sure. It, okay. Thanks. Sure. Um, so the overall idea behind a lot of what's in H-742 is giving flexibility to the administration to respond to issues that may come up around um, the, uh, well, in dealing with COVID-19. Um, and so this piece of it was to give some flexibility to be able to make changes to the provider tax provisions that apply to different classes of healthcare providers um, so that they might not have to pay the, the full amount or they might get to pay on a different schedule than normal in order to uh, provide them, ensure that they have additional cash flow that they may need in this time. So when we had briefly looked at the language, whenever it was that we were all together, um, there was language that would allow, originally would allow the Secretary of Human Services to waive, modify, or postpone um, all or a prorated portion of provider taxes. And your committee um, broke out and treated a little bit differently the hospital piece than the other providers. So you had um, no waiver authority on the provider tax for hospitals, but modification postponement authority for hospitals. And then the waive, modify, or postpone for the others. Um, and then, uh, I think after we talked about it in committee, some additional work was done that would add in some approval processes for the joint fiscal committee. Um, so it would require the secretary, if the secretary proposed to take some action on the provider tax, to provide to the joint fiscal committee the secretary's rationale for exercising that authority, including the balance between the fiscal impact of the proposed action on the state budget and the needs of the specific class or classes of providers for which he was changing the provider tax, and then also provide to the Joint Fiscal Committee a plan for mitigating the fiscal impact to the state. And then uh, if the Joint Fiscal Committee approved that plan for mitigating the fiscal impact to the state, then the secretary could take the action uh, on the provider tax unless some part of the mit mitigation plan required approval of the emergency board, and then it would have to go through the board before the secretary could take that action. Um, so that is the language that was sent over from the House, and there were a couple of changes made on the Senate side and what the Senate passed. Um, the first being that this language would apply, this authority to make changes in the provider tax would apply not only during a declared state of emergency as a result of COVID-19, but also for a period of six months following the termination of the state of emergency, so that flexibility would last longer. Uh, and then the other change was to take out specific reference to um, postponing payment of the provider tax. Uh, in looking more at the language, we realized that the it's really the DIVA commissioner who sets the schedule and who has existing authority to allow variations from the payment schedule and to waive late fees um, if somebody pays, if a provider pays their tax late. So between the ability to, to modify the payment schedule and to waive late fees, it seemed that the commissioner already had the authority to postpone payments or allow postponement of payments, uh, but not to waive or waive payment or modify the amount. So what came over from the Senate then would say during a declared state of emergency as a result of COVID-19 and for six months after, the Secretary of Human Services may modify payment of all or a prorated portion of the hospital provider tax and may waive or modify payment of all or a prorated portion of the other provider taxes if two conditions were met. Um, we, we no longer needed to say if there was a state of emergency declared because there has been one. So the condition that the action is necessary to preserve the ability of the providers to continue offering necessary healthcare services and the secretary has obtained the approval of the joint fiscal committee and the emergency board as set forth in subsections B and C, which is the part that says um, get approval for the mitigation plan. And if it requires any of it requires e-board authority or e-board approval, then get the e-boards approval as well. 
Okay. <clears throat> Let me see if there's questions. Anyone have um, questions about this? Uh, Jen, this is uh, going to be on the floor in the house. Yes, that's my understanding. This is part of H742, which is one of the two bills that is, or, or is the main uh, emergency response bill for COVID-19. Okay. Um, and uh, do committee members want to ask anything or uh, Nolan, did you have anything that you wanted to, um, to weigh in on? It's amazing how much has changed between uh, today and when we first looked at this. Um, no. uh, let me see if anybody has got a question. Can people hear me? Yeah, I can. Okay. Um, the only thing I would add to that is just in my fiscal note I wrote is that you know there's only a fiscal impact to the extent that the governor actually implements this. Um, and some quick facts that I threw in here is that the hospital provider tax averages roughly twelve and a half million dollars per month in revenue. The other provider tax revenues raise approximately 1.85 million. Combined, the provider taxes represent 24% of the state dollars used to draw a federal match. So I just want to throw those numbers out there. Oh, and total provider tax is roughly $170 million a year in state dollars. Yeah. It seems like what we're doing is we're giving the administration flexibility to, to maximize dollars while minimizing impact. Um, which makes sense to me, given where we are and what we're, how much we're depending on our healthcare providers at the moment. Uh, anyone have a question here? Okay. Um, great. Jen, Nolan, thank you. There's nothing else in the bill that we should be worried about. Not hey, that Janet, Peter has a question. Oh, oh, okay, Peter. Guys, please use your raise hand symbol. Go ahead, Peter. You're, you're not, you need to unmute. Okay, you're good. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes? Yes. Okay, sorry. Uh, just as I recall, when we were uh, talking about this earlier, the um, uh, important element in choosing what to forgive, what to postpone, uh, really revolved around what was needed to satisfy and maximize the match from the federal government. And I assume that is still an element in choosing what to forgo, what to postpone amongst the provider taxes. Right, so the conditions that are required in order to waive or uh, waive or modify payment is that um, that the well sorry I should I should say more the rationale if, if the secretary proposes to waive or modify the they have to provide the rationale for exercising the authority and that rationale has to include the balance between the fiscal impact of the proposed action on the state budget and the needs of the providers and also include a mitigation pl plan um, for mitigating the fiscal impact to the state. So if there's a way, for example, to make up some of the provider to, foregone provider tax revenue through additional federal funding, that might be part of the mitigation plan and it most, might also affect um, that balance in the rationale between the fiscal impact and the needs of the providers. So I, I think it allows, uh, it allows the secretary to look more holistically at what's going on both inside the providers um, who are responsible for paying the provider tax and also what is available to the state in funding from other sources. Thank you. Anyone else have a question? Looking around, uh, I don't see one. Um, Jen, I can't remember if I got the answer from you or not. Um, there's nothing else in the bill that, we, that concerns us particularly other than maybe some license fees. Uh, right. Yeah, actually, for the license fees, the only thing would just be that they, um, it's not changing any existing license fees for LA. professionals. It just allows people yeah. who are coming in from elsewhere um, or who are re retirees returning to the workforce to, to have temporary licenses without a fee. Yeah. So it's nothing, nothing yeah. less than we would have expected. Right. Since yeah. there, there's also stuff in the transportation that um, postpones fees as well. 
that there is actually a very significant, um, you mean the DMV fees, those are huge. Yeah. Um, Section 36. We have not looked at those. Um, um, I don't think we're going to change them at this stage, frankly. My, my understand the governor's already doing it. Exactly. That's what I understand. All right. Um, <coughs> pardon me. Um, so I think we'll thank you both very much. Um, and uh, I think we'll close this meeting down. Uh, for those who weren't yet back on the call, um, we're going to meet at 10 tomorrow morning. Uh, same same routine, um, and we'll have information out to you before then. If there are people that you uh, want to hear from, either from the earlier discussions, today's discussion, or some other issue that you that has come up that you'd like some information on, please let Sorsha and me know, um, and we will get people scheduled. I hope to have a little more information about the federal uh, legislation tomorrow. I think that would be that would certainly be helpful and maybe a little bit reassuring, I hope. Um, so it's certainly in the, in the education area it is. So um, please do keep in touch. We do, we are on the floor at one o'clock and whatever form that takes, I don't know exactly what that's gonna look like. Um, I'm not there, I'm home as you can tell. Uh, so thank you everybody. Have a good day, be safe.